So I would love to share with all of you then some ideas about um, different ways of doing and models of access to healthcare. And obviously today we are going to look at um, gender affirming healthcare and, and what has been happening there. So, so we see there's basically four main models that we see in South Africa. Um, the first one is the gatekeeping model and Anastasia is going to speak quite around the ethics of gatekeeping versus in the informed consent model just after I've presented these slides to you. But the gatekeeping model we have seen over the years coming very strongly through in gender affirming healthcare. Well, at a stage we call it sex reassignment and over the years we have had so many different words for this. Why we call it now gender affirming is we are affirming the person's gender. We are not taking the person from one side of the gender binary right through to the other side. But what has happened in healthcare, and, and one can ask a lot of questions surrounding that, is that people, healthcare professionals, and quite often, unfortunately, mental healthcare providers, were the people deciding if a trans and gender diverse person could affirm their body to fit the gender through healthcare interventions. And, and even still in South Africa, this is happening. So a trans and gender diverse person would be sent off to the psychologist or psychiatrist to determine if they're trans enough or trans at all to be able to access the health care. And even in some of our provinces still, we have to subscribe to this idea of you first have to go for six months to a psychologist before you can access hormones or HRT. And, and what happens then is the healthcare provider is placed in a position of power and control and authority over the trans person's body. And the healthcare provider then decides what is allowed for this person to change. And, and that is a very destructive mode to be in. We also get the medical model, the paternalistic model, or the medical model that's quite often paternalistic. Again, where it's a top-down approach that when a client comes into the office of their healthcare provider, they have to perform in certain ways in order to access healthcare. So they have to perform as trans enough or gender diverse enough. Um, they might have to already did some social transitioning, lived as their gender identity for already a year. Quite often it's then called the chosen gender, not the inherent gender that the person already is. And then again, from a top-down approach, the healthcare provider would say, you know what, yes, you may. And this is what we're going to do. And I know the best, what is best for you. And unfortunately, quite often in the medical model, we also start to see this coming through. On the other side is the right, rights-based model, which is quite often used by the activists. And in this model, the activist or the trans person would come into the space and say, I have the right to access all these healthcare. It is according to the South African constitution, I may access healthcare and you have to provide it. And what we see often happening then is when the stronger voice comes from the so-called patient side or the client side into the space, that healthcare says, no, 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 we, we're not going to engage with you on this. We know we are the experts. You're not the expert of your own body and your own life. This is not how things are. We are the experts on hormones and surgery. We know, again, what's best for you. And we get that kind of very strong 
in no way you can't go further with your requests or especially then demands. And quite often when we see that kind of demand coming through, healthcare just shuts down and say, there's no way. Now, you're still going to hear a lot about informed consent today. And, and it's a model that is now also utilized in, for example, the Vitz Orange Eye Clinics that Tammy is going to speak about later. But it is also the informed consent model is try, quite a strong model that has been used in gender affirming healthcare. So that is where the person is given the information and then they can inform themselves by listening to this information and these wisdoms and ideas. And then they can decide if they want to consent to gender affirming healthcare or not. And I'm not going to go into too much depth now because I know Anastasia is going to speak around that. But what I would like to speak about is the participatory approach that we have developed in KZN. And in this approach, we have done it a bit different. So our team includes the trans and gender diverse person. We work very strongly with support groups and Linda Rabani will speak a little bit later on the support groups. We usually have a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker in the team. We have the more, I don't want to say common, but the usual members of the MDT team that might be the doctors, nursing staff, the endocrinologists, surgeon, speech therapist, dietitian, occupational therapist. We might also have the other, and I put this in inverted commas, the other members, where we bring in the parents of the trans and gender diverse person, the family, the friends, the school, the church, the community. And all of these people become part of the participatory approach. Our focus is on the individual person or client, the trans and gender diverse person's needs. And we work from a construct of empowering. Now, using the word empowering is already very controversial because it's not giving power to the trans and gender diverse person. That, that is not where we're coming from. But more exploring that is already inherent the power in the person, that power that's already there. And by exploring and opening it up together um, as a community of care, the person in essence empowers themselves to become the person driving their health care forward. So in our team, we have a shared goal, a shared direction and a shared timeline. And it's based on what the client places out there. So who is then the expert? Well, in the end, we all have different skills and we have different knowledges. So the trans and gender diverse person is the most knowledgeable about their own lives and their lived experience. As a cisgender clinician, you can't really tell a person, you know what, this is how it feels to be trans. You, you don't know. You can listen and you can learn and you can take in what your trans and gender diverse clients share with you, but it's their lived experience. And we also need to be aware that one trans person's lived experience is not the other person's trans person's lived experience. Yes, there's definitely aspects that will be shared, but it's a lot of lived experiences together and lived lives together. And it's this complementary knowledge that can be shared. Then there's also complementary knowledge coming from mental health care. I mean, we've studied for years as psychologists, as psychiatrists, as mental health care nurses in this field, as social workers. And, and we can bring all these aspects into the team. Then we have the doctors. 
that has also studied for years, and the endocrinologists even more years, that can bring in their expertise. The surgeons, with all their knowledges, can also bring it to the team, and our OTs, our dietitians, and our speech therapists. So all of us can bring these knowledges. But we must not in the end forget that our trans and gender diverse people become the ambassadors to their health care. They can take it out. They can go and train other people. And, and that is what's so amazing about this participatory approach, that most of the work being done in the field is not being done by healthcare providers, but by our trans and gender diverse community. And later on, Sazi will also speak to that about what is happening in KZN and, and how that is being done. That the trans and gender diverse person would, for example, go to home affairs and, and train the people there on how to do um, gender changes in the ID documents. But they also go out to the community because in the end, they live in communities. We all live in communities. I think sometimes when we say the word community, we think of, oh, it's the community out there, but we form part of our communities. And as trans people, we can go into our community, but also as trans aware people, we can go into communities. So when you go to the nearest shopping mall, have you looked if there is a, toilet space for the trans person, for the gender non-conforming person, for the person that do not want to go to one with a little bit of dresses or the one with pants, but wants to go to a gender neutral toilet. When, when you do research, have you challenged it there? In your religious spaces, we heard the other day of one person saying as a doctor, she went to a Bible study and everybody kind of freaked out because she's working with gender affirming health care. And, and then, in a certain sense, yes, to destabilize a space that people can reconstruct it to be more inclusive, more fair, more bringing everybody into the fold. And, and it's these spaces that we're going to also look at. Now, I know Ron most probably will also look um, speak to school spaces and how we as healthcare workers can also go into the school spaces and make it more affirming and more open to our trans youth. When we train, we train as healthcare workers, but also as trans people. So we bring everybody into the training and we also, on the one side are presenters, but we also training our trans people to have all the information about gender affirming healthcare, that when they access it, they even know more quite often than the doctors that they approach. And as Jean also mentioned earlier, we're already training in university departments to open it up. So I know Alma has done some of those work. I have Jean, Mershon, Anastasia, and, and it is basically going out, oh, and Kevin, going out with all these knowledges and spreading it also to our students and the next generation that's going to step into this role. So as part of the participatory approach, we have become activists and advocates for our clients and as gender affirming experts. And we also do research because in the end, it is our obligation to put more research out there that is from an African voice and that we can decolonize also our spaces as gender diverse people. So what do we incorporate? Yes, we incorporate the elements of informed consent. We share knowledges. We understand the emotional, social, and physical changes. We understand the side effects that HRT could bring. We do use and incorporate a rights-based model because human rights form an important part in our work. And yes, we also embrace the medical model. What we don't do, is we don't embrace the gatekeeping model. So what is our role? Well, the role of a therapist could be support. Assessment, do we really need to assess? Well, we know that WPATH still says you need one, uh, two reports to access certain types of surgery, one report to access certain other surgeries. But 
what about a participatory assessment where you sit down with your clients and work together and write together that report? Well, that's what we do in KZN. That when the person walks in, that reports, they know absolutely everything that's in it because they produce it together with me. I also walk together with my clients. And, you know, sometimes it is to go and drink coffee in a coffee shop where the person for the first time maybe presents socially with a gender that is inherently already there. As professionals, we need to acknowledge that we have inherent power due to our studies, due to the profession that we hold. But let's use it to be an advocate and an activist for our clients. Let's use it to go out there. I can remember when we had a stock out of testosterone, the trans people kept on phoning Pfizer and it, they would every time just say, no, no, we, we're working on, it, working on it. But the moment we phoned a CISA, it's a psychological society of South Africa saying, what's happening with the stock out? We got movement. We got that they wanted to see us, engage with us. So we need to accept that there is power in the roles that we have. As a parent of a trans and gender diverse person, you have powers that, for example, people that aren't parents don't have, even if they're a doctor, they don't have that power. But let's use it and let's share that power. So in essence, let's, in the end, be led by the trans and gender diverse person and always remember we need to work in affirming ways.